Morning Wind First Assembly. If you would, join us in worship. a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies I'll raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief I'll raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I'll raise a hallelujah, heaven comes to fight for me, cause I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. Is a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah, and I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I'll raise a hallelujah Fear you've lost your hold on me Cause I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roar And up from the ashes Hope will arise Death is defeated The king is alive Sing a little louder, oh sing a little louder, sing a little louder, sing a little louder, oh sing a little louder, in the presence of my enemies, sing a little louder, louder than the unbelief, sing a little louder. My weapon is a melody, sing a little louder, and heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar, up from the ashes, hope will arise, death is defeated, the king is alive. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me for I took a breath you breathed your life in me you been so, so good to me, and oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, and oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99, I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still you give yourself away And all oh, the overwhelming, never-ending 
reckless love of God. When I was your foe, still your love fought for me. You have been so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. God, and so oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away, and so oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. And so oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. And so oh, the Overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. In this time, desperation. When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one salvation We believe We believe And in this broken generation when all is dark, you help us see There is only one foundation We believe, we believe, yeah We believe in God the Father We believe in Jesus Christ We believe in the Holy Spirit and he's given us new life we believe in the crucifixion we believe that he conquered death we believe in the resurrection and he's coming back again we believe so let our faith be more than anthem and greater than the songs we see in our weakness and temptations 
Christ, we believe in the Holy Spirit, and He's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion, we believe that He conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and He's coming back again. So let the lost be found, the dead be raised, and the here and now. Let love invade, let the church live loud. Our God will say, we believe, we believe that the gates of hell will not prevail. For the power of God is torn the veil. We know your love will never fail. We believe, we believe, we believe in God the Father. We believe in Jesus Christ. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And he's given us new life. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection. And he's coming back again. We believe. Oh, we believe. Good evening, Winfrey's Assembly of God. We're so glad that you've come to join us again tonight in worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Uh, I want to just encourage you that if you need to give of your tithe and offering, that you can give by text message. You can text the word give to the number on your screen. Just follow the promptings there. Or you can go to our website at www.wfaliving.com. Go to the donation or giving portion of the screen. And uh, follow all the promptings there. You can mail your tithes and offerings to P.O. Box 1085 when Arkansas. Or at the church, there is a giving receptacle out in the foyer. You can go there and also give. And so we just want you to know that uh, we appreciate your faithfulness and continuing in your giving. So God bless you. Well, if you will, turn with me again to book of Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, we're going to start with verse 16 through 24 once again. We're doing part two of this morning's sermon uh, called Seven Excuses That Will Keep You Out of Heaven. Seven Excuses That Will Keep You Out of Heaven. Luke chapter 14, starting with verse 16, this is what the scripture says. It says, but he said to them, a man once gave a banquet or a great banquet and invited many. And at that time for the banquet, he sent his servants for, to say to those who have been invited, come for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses for the first said to him, I have bought a field and I must go out and see it. Please have me excuse. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen and I got to go and examine them. Please have me excuse. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then his master of the house came angry and said to his servants, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, we have done, uh, we have, what you have commanded have been done, and we, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, as we are examining these excuses and as we are examining our hearts, once again, Father, may we be in understanding that, Lord, there is no excuse for us missing heaven. And Father, I pray that as your Holy Spirit is speaking to our hearts, may we be quick and readily to uh, uh, to answer his call and answer his beckoning, O oh God. And I pray that tonight, if someone doesn't know you as our Lord and Savior, that they will hear these words 
and that they'll call upon your name to make their life right with you. And we give you the praise and glory and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let me refresh your memory from this morning. We discussed four different types of, uh, or four uh, excuses. The first one was everybody else is doing it. We hear that often as an excuse. Number two is times are changing. Again, <laughs> I've heard this one constantly even modern preachers are using this that God is changing because the times have changed excuse number three was I don't believe like you do and the last one we discussed this morning was I am very sincere in what I believe so I want to finish this second part up with uh, excuse number five and excuse number five is this that the Bible is too complicated undoubtedly you may have heard this or even yourself have spoken these words and given this excuse for not becoming part of the uh, of the kingdom of God I don't understand the Bible it's too complicated for people to understand there is no sense in even trying have you ever said those words have you ever thought of those words that the Bible is just too complex it's just outdated and there's no way that I can even understand it for virtually every excuse that comes into the mind and the heart of mankind ha can have a strong rebuttal in the word of God. And this one exactly has, uh, is not exempt from that. For Romans chapter 1, the apostle Paul tells us that people are without excuse. Look at verse 19. It says, for what can be, be known about God is plain for them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they are without excuse you see ignorance is no excuse for breaking the law have you ever gone through a town where there was a speed trap? And a lot of those speed traps, they, they kind of, uh, uh, at least I've had this one, ex uh, this one uh, uh, experience in Louisiana that we were on our way back home from Gulf Shores, and, and we got into this little bitty town in Louisiana just, just south of the, the Arkansas uh, border. And, and, and as we come into this town, I, I began to look at my speed limit because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't uh, speeding. And before you knew it, I looked up in my rearview mirror and there was blue lights pulling me over and said that I was going 15 miles over. I was, I was, doing, I was doing 45 in, in an, an area where we here in Arkansas have 45 miles an hour. But they had knocked that thing down to 30, and they hit the sign so well that it blended in with everything else. I never even saw it. But yet the matter of fact was I was ignorant to what the speed limit was, but yet I still broke the law. You see, there's no excuse. There is no excuse. Ignorance or lack of understanding of the word is not an acceptable reason people may give for not accepting the Lord as their Savior. You see, there is no excuse for a person to not be saved. You see, there are so many things in life we don't understand. Yet even though we don't understand them, we have accept them and live according to those standards. For instance, how does a black cow eat green grass and produce white milk and yellow butter? I don't know. I don't understand how all that happens, but yet that's just how things go, that a black cow can eat green grass and produce white milk. Likewise, it is difficult to explain the spiritual birth any better than it is to explain the natural birth. Yet even though it cannot be explained, we receive it as fact and thank God that we are born. We thank God for creation. We cannot explain it, but we believe it by faith because it was written in the word of God. We cannot explain God because it, it, if we could explain God, he is no longer God. It is difficult for us to explain even the Trinity, but there is a Father and there is a Son and there is a Holy Spirit and the three form the one true Godhead and we believe it because the Bible declares that it is so. The Bible says that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ by faith. Understand it? No. Explain it? Probably 
probably not, but it is true nevertheless. The Bible says that we are also saved by grace through faith. Can you explain grace? Our finite minds cannot comprehend how it works that a hell-bound sinner come in one moment, kneels at a foot of the cross and at the altar, repents of their sins, stand up, and walks out saved and delivered in a new creation. We simply cannot define how the Holy Spirit moves into one's life and changes him or changes her from the guttermost to the uttermost. Still millions throughout all the world will testify to the changing power of Jesus Christ. There's some things, my friends, you can't explain. There's some things you will never be able to understand. But my friends, hear me today. Even though we can't understand it, we can accept that the nature and the way things happen and God is powerful and all of these graces that he has given us, even if we don't understand it, that doesn't mean that we can't come and receive a Holy Father and his forgiveness of our lives. I don't understand it. It's not a valid excuse. If we do not understand it, find someone who does understand it and ask them to explain the plan of salvation, to explain the things of God, to explain the attributes of God to the best as their ability. It is a plan that causes us, or a plan that causes us to know and realize that we are sinners. This plan of salvation, it, it helps us to understand what we cannot save ourselves. This plan of salvation knows that God has made a way by sending Jesus Christ as our Savior, recognizes that we need to receive him as our Lord and Savior. And this plan, live by faith, knowing, realizing, and believing with our hearts, then confessing that Jesus Christ and the word of truth with our mouth. My friends, this plan is just laid out before us because the word of God simply begins to share these things with us. It is not necessary for us to understand the plan. We must, however, accept it as a plan that works. It is a plan that is tried and it is tested. Millions are in heaven today because of this very plan that I spoke about tonight. It is not a valid excuse to say I do not understand the Bible. It is too complicated. Furthermore, I want to uh, ask you that, or tell you that God will not accept it as an excuse when you stand before him on judgment day one day day simply turn to God in prayer and ask him. Ask him, number one, to forgive you of your sins and to help you live for him. But number two, ask him to send the Holy Spirit to help you, uh, to, to teach you the word of God. Because as you ask him, he will begin to reveal the mysteries of the gospel of Jesus Christ to your life. These simple truths of faith and grace and justification and forgiveness and redemption and all of these things that we hold true to our hearts that are true biblical principles of the kingdom of God. If you will ask God to show you and reveal to you, he will make these complex or what we think are complex truths plain and simple. Don't try to understand it. Only believe. Believe in God. Believe that he loves you. Believe that he wants to forgive you. Believe that he wants to change your life. Believe that he can take the worst stuff in your life, turn it around, and make it for his good. Excuse number six I want to share with you is this. I, I'll pull it off or I'll, I'll, I'll work it out some way. You see, here is yet another dangerous excuse trending on the same arrogant ground as Satan before he was cast out of heaven. You see, some people say in their self-confidence, I'll put it off, or it is almost as if they are saying, I'll, I'll sneak into heaven. I'll pull it off one day. I'll work it out somehow, some way. I'm going to be there. You see, so many people say, oh, I believe that just before I die, God will give me an opportunity to make things right. My friends, let me tell you something. If that's how you're thinking, and that's your excuse right now for not making a commitment unto God, you are gambling in astronomical portions uh, as and millions of those people 
who have rolled the dice that says, you know what, right before I die, I'll get my heart right with, with God, lost in that gamble and dying without ever having the opportunity to talk to God ever again. Listen, my friends, you don't know that in the moment that you get in your vehicle that you'll be in an accident and you'll be gone before you can even call upon the name of the Lord. My friends, you could be out there working in the garden and have a heart attack before you could call upon the name of the Lord. Listen, today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. Don't try to work it out in the last moment. You must understand this. You may have a way with people, but you cannot have your way with God. The only way you have with God is the way, and that has been provided through Jesus Christ. You can't weasel your way into heaven. You can't negotiate your way into heaven. You can't uh, uh, earn your way into heaven. My friends, the only way that you can get yourself into heaven is line yourself up with the way, Jesus Christ. For Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Many would say this process is too difficult for the price is too high. To the contrary, it is quite easy for you to lay aside the excuses of your life and accept this very truth. It is a matter of making a decision and saying, Here I am, Lord. I realize I'm a sinner. I cannot, I cannot save myself, but I am in need of a Savior, and I want to give my life to you. My friends, it's simple. Just saying those few sentences, that couple of phrases can change your life, can change your life, and the Holy Spirit can come and to transform you into a brand new person. Most important of all, you must come to realize that God has provided a plan and that your responsibility is completing this plan for for your life is to turn away from sin, we call that repentance, and allow Jesus Christ to take control of your life. The process literally calls us to step up from the throne of our lives, give over the control of our lives, and allow Jesus to become enthroned as ruler every facet of our lives. If Christ is not Lord of all, my friends, he's not Lord at all. You see, the Bible says, that if you have not received Jesus, you are lost and will not be a part of that great banquet that we just read in our text. You will not be a part of the marriage feast of the Lamb. The invitation has been given freely, but you must accept that wonderful invitation. You see, the Bible is well filled with people who have said some other time I'll, 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 uh, I'll have other things to finish first procrastination my friends is one of the most dangerous decisions ever made by anyone in the Bible we are not the ones who determine our length of time here on earth now we may can do everything we can we can eat healthy we can exercise we can do things that are healthy for our bodies and, and withhold from those unhealthy habits but my friends even those who have done everything right by the textbook by the way the doctors have said they too have even ended their lives very quickly my friends it is God who is the author and finisher of our faith and our life and he is the one that is in control of the span of your life many people make a decision to set spiritual things in order in their lives then they procrastinate putting off decisions that may have fully intended to make it good in faith but in their procrastination time goes by and time goes on and many times people never find an opportunity to either make things right with God or hear the gospel of Jesus Christ ever again. Next time I'll do it. Next time I'll make the decision, people will say. It's an excuse that has its origin in the deepest pits of hell and Satan has convinced many and thousands of people that it is a true and valid excuse. There are three people that the gospel of Luke shares with us that invokes excuses to shield them from ever making a decision for Jesus Christ. We see one in Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18, verses 18 through 23, we find uh, that this portion of scripture refers to a rich young ruler. You see, this young man comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I have, I have kept every commandment. I have done all these things so that I can have eternal life. And Jesus asked him, he says, all right, if you've done 
all these things. He says, I got one more commandment for you. To go and sell your possessions, give it to the poor. And my friends, guess what? That young ruler left Jesus sad that day because the Bible says that he had much wealth and that he was sad that he would have to give it all up. You see, the second person that we see in Luke that, that made a procrastination and given them hearts to the Lord is in Luke chapter 12, verse 16 through 21. This portion of Scripture refers to this man as the rich fool. You see, God required the rich fool soul because he had in his heart made up and in his mind made up that he had no more, he didn't need to work anymore. He didn't have to labor anymore because he was so rich that he even tore down all of his barns and all of his silos that he would make bigger because he had greater harvest and greater work. And he said to himself, I no longer need to work. I no longer need to do anything for it is well with my soul. And my friends, the Bible says because he didn't depend upon God to be the source of his, uh, for his life and that he depended upon himself and his own wealth and his own goods, his soul was re uh, required of him in that day. He procrastinated and not, did not call upon the name of the Lord. You see, the third person we find in the book of Luke is found in Luke chapter 16 verse 19 through 31. This passage has two individuals that are mentioned. One is a rich man and the other was a beggar named Lazarus. You see the beggar named Lazarus was at the gates of this rich man's house. He just wanted just even the crumbs that fell off the, the, the table. Listen, I just had lunch just a moment ago, eating some of my pizza and part of the toppings fell into the floor. That's what he wanted. He wanted the stuff that fell off the top of the pizza and that rolled on the bottom of the floor that many of our pets go and eat. He just wanted the, the scraps. He just wanted the things that came off of the table. And yet the man was so full of pride and so full of greed that he would even share the scraps with Lazarus. The Bible says that both of these men died on the same day. But something happened. The rich man, because of his greediness and not depending upon God to take care of his life and to be the Lord of his life and to be generous with the things that God has blessed him with, went to hell. The Bible says he was tormented. He was so tormented that he just asked God that he saw Lazarus over in Abraham's bosom to dip his finger into water to quench the, 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 the dryness and the heat on his tongue. My friends, hear me today. When you procrastinate, you don't know what may hold for tomorrow. The Bible tells us that even King Felix heard the gospel message and he became frightened and said, go away for this present and I will find time and I will summon you. King Agrippa told Paul in a short time, you will persuade me to become a Christian, but he did not. And he never had the opportunity to hear the gospel message again. And both Felix and Agrippa, like the rich man, very likely opened their eyes when they died in hell. Many of have followed them. The sad news is that many more will yet follow them because they procrastinate. They make up excuses that I will somehow at one time or another will make things right with God. Guess what? The good news, you do not have to follow them. You don't have to follow these individuals that push that decision off at another time. You can follow another road, the road to heaven, to break the curse of the excuse in your life. Come on now, hear me today. Many of you have said, you know what? I'll give my heart over the next Easter or, or, or when Christmas comes up. My friends, I've had four members in my family that don't even will be able to see Christmas. My friends, listen, you never know you never know when the day will come where your name will be called and you will drop dead and you will be standing before a holy God. Don't make excuses. Don't procrastinate today. Make today the day of your salvation. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Somebody needs to hear that today. That time is drawing short for you. Don't procrastinate. Stop the excuses today. Stop the excuses the last excuse that I want to share with you tonight is this. I'm too bad or it's too late for me. See, still another person who has not received Christ may say, oh, no, no, no. I've just been too bad. I've, I've committed too many sins. It's too late for me. Friend, hear me today. It is never 
too late for you. My friends, hear me. The moment you draw your last breath, that's when it's too late. It is never too late. In Acts chapter 2, Peter saw as he's standing, he comes down from the from the upper room being filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and begins to give this explanation of what was taking place in that place in Jerusalem. And Peter, as he's preaching this message to, to thousands upon thousands of people, saw individuals who crucified Jesus. Jesus Christ. They had been saved on that day of Pentecost. These very same people who crucified Jesus stood among the 300 who cried out, what must we do to be saved? That day they were saved. They received the gift of eternal life. Those were the same people at one time that were yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Hear me today. There are times in your life that by the actions of you have done have yelled, crucify him, crucify him. They hear me today. Hear this brother in the Lord. I say that one of the scriptures that, that, that is dear to my heart says that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for your life. My friends, it's never too late. You're never too far gone. You haven't done too much bad stuff that God still loves you and in the moments that in the twinkling of an eye, you can give your heart over to the Lord and he will change your life forever. These individuals that stood on the day of Pentecost, yield crucified crucify was also yelling what must we be uh, what must we do to be saved this burning in our heart and Peter said call upon the name of the Lord and you shall be saved it does not matter what sin you have committed the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse you from each and every single one of your sins it matters not how bad you may believe those sins are for God so loved you that he gave his holy begotten son so that you may have eternal life you may say well you just don't know how bad of a person i am you just don't know the horrible sins that i have com committed perhaps somebody will say you don't know how many times i have sinned i've sinned over and over and over again hear me today the blood of jesus will cleanse you from all your sins whether your sins is one of a thousand or a hundred thousand or a million or a billion the blood of jesus cleanses you from all of your sin whether you want to turn uh, it as a little sin or a big sin you may believe that yours is a mountainous of sin and yet God can never forgive you then know this my friends the grace of God is sufficient to make the vilest sinner clean you see he stands ready open uh, readily to cleanse you from all your sins and all your iniquities the blood of Jesus still has power to set the captives free the apostle Paul was the chiefest of all sinners yet God saved him you see in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15 the apostle Paul was writing to his spiritual son Timothy and he says that the same is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost my friends this man he was the one who persecuted the church he was the one that killed Christians left and right and yet there was a day my friends he came in contact with a man named Jesus Christ on the road of Damascus and with a mighty explosion of the gospel truth his life was transformed he was the darkest of darkest of he was held by that religious spirit he was the Pharisees of all Pharisees he said he was the one that had the understanding of all of the laws and he in his own mind practiced all of the laws and yet he could have all of the religious stuff down and his heart was far from the Lord my friends hear me today God can save even the most vilest of sinner if you are that person today and you say pastor I am I am sinful pastor I have done too much pastor there is no way God can love me I am so far from here him hear me today God loves you and no matter what you've done no matter how bad you feel like you are that's not an excuse for the blood of Jesus for Jesus loves you so much that he died to forgive you of your sins you may even have shaken your fists at God you may have stomped your foot at him. You may have become so angry with God that your life has been filled with bitterness. But there is a loving God who says to you right now in this moment, no matter what you have done, I have 
I am merciful. No matter what you have done, I am a God of grace and I'm a God of compassion. And if you will turn to me, I will save you and I will cleanse you and I will remember your sins no more. Are you listening to this preacher this evening? When God forgives, he forgets and that forgetting is not in a negligence on the part of God. When God forgets, he willingly wipes your sin from his mind. He remembers your sin no more. Oh, my friends, this is something to be excited about. This is something that you should shout about, that when you have given your heart over to Jesus, he no longer remembers the things that you've done that have hurt him, that have maybe been against his will. But, my friends, he will forgive you, and he will pardon you with full benefits. He says, I will remember your sins no more. Thank God. When you come to Jesus and repent of your sins, he cleanses you by his precious blood. And through the Holy Spirit, you become a brand new person. You see, the old things the Bible tells us of the old life is passed away and your sins are blotted out. And you know you become a brand new person. You become a brand new creature in God. God is ready to forgive you. He is ready to forgive your evil deeds, to forget your sins, no matter how big you may consider them to be. Do not say to yourself, I'm too bad. Do not say that you have wandered too far from God and from home. Do not say that there is no rescue for me anymore because God still loves you. He's like that that father of the prodigal son who's looking for the dust in in the background, in the horizon. He's looking for you to come to him with a heart of repentance saying, Father, I am sorry, Father. I have done wrong, Father. I have sinned against you. I've sinned against my, my, my father's house. I've sinned against myself and I have sinned against God. My friends, God wants to forgive you today. Stop putting it off. You're not too bad. God loves you. If you're ready, if you're ready to be cleansed, if you're ready to be set free, even saved today, I want you to know this one thing. You do not have to wait until next Sunday to get this thing right. Do you hear me? You don't have to worry about waiting for next Sunday morning to come to a church house, to come to an altar to give your life over to Jesus. You may have even been in this service this morning and said, you know what, Pastor, I put it off. I didn't give my heart over to the Lord. Hear me today. Today, today you can make that. Right now you can make that decision. It's never too late. It's, the Bible tells us that every day is filled with new mercies. Tomorrow, there will be new mercies. But hear me today. Don't wait for tomorrow. Today's the day of salvation. If that's you today and you say, Pastor, I've done wrong. I've, I, I, I've been away from God. There's no way that God could love me. Listen, if you'll just trust him, he will save your soul to the uttermost. Maybe you're watching me and you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've Man, you, there's been t- you, you've just royally messed up. You've flubbed up. And there's, you, you might be even saying, Lord, God, there, there's no way you can. L-. Listen, even God can save you. Even God can forgive you. Even God can wash you of those faults. He can forgive the things that you have done against him. My friends, today, God wants to touch you. He still saves. He still changes your life. Will you just pray with me, Father? I pray in Jesus' name that you will forgive me of my sins. The things that I have done wrong that has, been, that has been against your will, that has been against your word, and that has been against your love. Father, I repent of those things. Forgive me. Make me new. Wash me white as snow. For I know that I'm not too bad, and I haven't done, gone too far for you that your love still extends. Father, I don't want to procrastinate, for tomorrow may not come. For tomorrow may not come for me. And Father, I might not understand it all. Yes, I might read the Word of God. I might read my Bible, and I don't understand it. It might be complicated to me in my own understanding. But, Father, I know that whatever your Word says is true because you are a good God, and you are a good Father, and you love me, and your Word declares it to me. And, Lord, I'm just going to trust you, and I'm going to believe in you, and I'm going to give my heart and my life to you, and I'm going to follow you all the days of my life. Father, I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. 
and make you the Lord of my life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. If you pray something like that in your heart, if you were watching me and you were saying, Father, that's the prayer of my heart, will you do something? Let us know. Let us know that you've let your heart be made known unto God, that you've put away the excuses of your life and you've given your life over to God. Let us know so that, A, we can celebrate with you, but number two, that we can put resources in your hands so that you can become greater in, in the things of God, that you could grow in the things of God and understand the truths of God in a plain, simple way. Listen, my friends, thank you for joining us tonight. We love you. We, we're excited for what God is doing in your life. We're believing for good things for you. We're believing for good things for Win First Assembly of God. Remember, I love you. There's nothing you can do about it. If you need us, reach out to us. We're glad to be here for you. We love you. Bye-bye. We'll see you next Sunday.